Hello everyone. Welcome to the Lake Rejuvenation and Management course. This is a collaborative initiative by Bangalore University, Friends of Lakes, Biome, and Atri. The purpose of this course is to educate citizens on lake rejuvenation, covering both engineering and environmental aspects. Happy learning. Introducing the next speaker, Dr. Veena Srinivasan. So uh, this first session is on integrated urban water management. And uh, what I hope to cover is the following four topics. First, I thought, um, asked what's the state of urban water systems in India? And uh, we have a set of questions associated with that. Then we asked, how do lakes inter intersect with the urban water system? Then we look at some broad management approaches that exist for managing urban water systems. And then finally, we ask, how do we make complex decisions? Right. And for each of these, I'll try and answer the questions on the right. Now, uh, for some of the classes, uh, we will provide um, materials, additional material which will be posted on Google Classroom. And so you'll have a chance to, to look at it in uh, a little more detail. And on Google Classroom, the question is coming up over and over again that we have put the videos from last course online. It is linked from Google Classroom. So even if you've missed today's class, not a problem. You'll be at least able to see very similar content. What we will find it difficult to do is to edit these videos immediately and make them available. Um, but regardless, you can at least get really close. So the first topic today is in the present state of today's urban uh, water systems. And uh, so I wanted to start off with first saying, how do water utilities, that is the city water supply and sewerage boards, how do they think about water supply? So they think about water supply as we, there's a reservoir. So depending on which city you are in, uh, if it's um, uh, Bombay, then it would be uh, the Kansa, Tansa and so on. If it is Bangalore, then it would be KRS. If it's Chennai, it would be Red Hills and Pundi and so on. So they, they think of there's a water supply reservoir. You build a pipeline from the water supply reservoir, bring it to a water treatment plant where it gets treated to drinking water quality. It is then pumped to the city and sent to these kinds of overhead pumping stations. And from there, it gets pumped into the uh, pipe supply network. And it comes usually to an under, underground sump in your building. And then you will pump it from the sump to an overhead tank. And then it flows by gravity into the taps in your house. And then uh, any wastewater that is released similarly goes through an underground drainage system. And then the underground drainage system may, uh, may additionally have pumping stations and so on. And then it's taken to a sewage treatment plant. The water is treated and that treated water is released into a lake or a river. This is the conceptualization, the engineering conceptualization of what our urban water system looks today. Now, of course, there are uh, in all over India, the cities are growing much faster than we are growing our pipe supply and sewerage networks. And as a result of that, you'll have many suburbs or peri-urban areas where urbanization has already happened, but the pipe supply network and the sewerage network has not yet reached that place. So in those places, the most common uh, source of water would be either wells, or if the groundwater is in bad condition or has dried up, then it may be tankers. And the wastewater may either be let out into the drains and it may just be polluting whatever local body is there, or it may be going into a soak pit and it may soak into groundwater. So both of these are the, the, the pipe supply at the water and the wastewater side of urban water. Now, um, as I said that, you know, the, 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 if you look at only Bang Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board's conceptualization of it, this is what comes under their jurisdiction. The pipe supply, the sewage treatment plants, the pumping stations, and the water supply networks. And often the reason that I put these uh, water droplets here is often there is a lot of leakage in the system. It's not that all the water supply that is brought in from the reservoir exactly reaches. And this leakage can be very significant. So cities like Bangalore, it may be 30-35%. Cities like Delhi, I've read newspaper reports where they say it's as high as 50%. Now, the reason we don't know whether it's really 30-35% or 50% because there are other 
we don't exactly know how much water is leaking. What they do know is the city was, utility will know how much went into the pipe supply system and how much got delivered to consumers. But whether there was theft in between or some of it was slum supply, which was not metered, there may be other sources and they will never know how much of it was theft and unmetered, what is called non-revenue water in the utilities and how much was leakage. But regardless, we know that the leakage component is very big and in fact, it forms almost half of the recharge in our urban cities comes from pipeline leakage. That is why in most cities in the city center, whether you go to Bangalore or you think about Chennai or you think about uh, any city, even Delhi, the city center, center where you get very good pipe supply, pressure is good and so on, your groundwater table will be very high because there's a lot of pipeline leakage. Okay, So this is the water supply component of it. Now, the wastewater component of it, on the other hand, once the city gets the pipe supply, it's going to generate sewage. All of us have to drink and bathe and cook and so on every day. And so a large amount of water is going to be generated as wastewater. Um, now, the water we put in our gardens, so that generally is not going back as wastewater. That is going to be taken up by the plants and go up into the atmosphere. The water, the, any what goes up as water vapor, what we call evapotranspiration. But apart from that, any water that is used inside the household is will generate wastewater. And they estimate most uh, uh, engineering departments will use the rule of thumb that between 75 and 80 percent of the water supply will come back as wastewater into the system. And so that is generally going into a uh, pipe supply network and into a sewage treatment plant. Or as I said before, if it's a peri-urban area, uh, then there won't be an underground drain. Even if it's a small town, there won't be an underground drainage network. Then the water may just show up in the water bodies untreated in various forms. It may go and soak into the ground if it's a soak pit system. Or if there is a, a septic tank system, then you'll get the honey suckers. Uh, you know, the trucks which come and suck out the water and take it to a fecal sludge plant, or it just go, gets released into the open drains and ends up in whatever local body. So this is the, uh, uh, the sewage side of the story. Now, the whole story of lakes and water bodies and becomes interesting because of the juxtaposition. That means we both of these systems um, exist simultaneously in the city. So now let me talk about the stormwater side of the story. Okay, now most cities will have drains. The drains that we see in 90% of cities, they are full of sewage. But that is not what their original intention or original design was for. Originally, they were designed to carry rainwater into the lakes and tanks. And instead, what happened was that uh, uh, over time, as our cities have grown, they carry a whole bunch of other things. Now, let's just look at what the drains themselves were. They were the in prehistoric times, before there was any urbanization or any people, the drains were really your river channels, right? It would rain, the water would accumulate and be carried around the channels. If there were natural wetlands or tanks or uh, natural wetlands or lakes, it might have drained into that. Otherwise, it would have gone into the river and eventually into the ocean. Now, what we see as tanks, at least in most parts of India, are human-made structures, uh, what we see as tanks and lakes. And at least in places in South India, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm hesitating to say this is the case of every single tank and lake in every part of India, but at least in South India, whatever we talk of as tanks were constructed by building by about four, uh, five, eight, ten centuries ago, somewhere starting around the eighth, ninth century is where their construction started, probably all the way to the 17th, 18th century. Um, not so much in British times, but mostly pre-colonial. And uh, they were constructed by the kings of that era by building earthen dams on the river channels themselves to hold back water. And the purpose was that in India, we have a monsoonal climate. It rains only three months of the year. The rest of the year, sometimes if you're in South India, you may get both monsoons a little bit. But the point is it's seasonal rainfall. This is very, very different, I should tell you, from any part of Europe. So if you see uh, Amsterdam or Netherlands or Paris or any of these places, they get rainfall throughout the year, right? And so seasonal rainfall is something which is very unusual when compared to temperate climates of Europe because you have a very long dry season. And therefore, the kings of the time had to collect the water for 
both domestic as well as livestock as well as a second uh, second crop in the dry season and that was the purpose for these which these drains were built and and the lakes were built so the they were never intended to be anything other than impoundments of rainwater now uh, it's important to realize that as cities uh, urbanize what does happen is that uh, the nature of this, uh, what we call in, as a, in a hydrology terms, we call it partitioning. That means when it rains, if how much of the water ends up and gets soaked up by the roots of trees and evapotranspired through the leaves into the atmosphere versus how much goes and gets soaked into the ground and becomes infiltration and how much runs off. Runs off is what Nagish calls Nagish mentioned it in his section, how much of it goes as river, uh, goes into the river and stream. These three things are where rainfall ends up ultimately. Now, as you urbanize, this ratio changes. So the first, what happens on one hand, you stop having trees because you cut down all your trees and you have buildings. So you have what we call paved area. So there's no roots of any plants which are going to take the water and evapotranspire it. So the first thing that happens is evapotranspiration goes down. The second thing that happens is because you paved your land, the land itself has become hard. It has no infiltration capacity, right? If we just concretize everything, there's no way the water can soak into the ground. So your recharge will go down. And if rainfall stays the same and your evapotranspiration has gone down and recharge has gone down, where is the rain going to end up? It's all going to end up as runoff and it's going to end up into your stream sessions. So into your streams and lakes. So one of the important things that happens with urbanization is that you have a sudden increase in the amount of surface water runoff being generated, less recharge and less evapotranspiration. And this has an implication for the entire water cycle. Now, this would be a case where if it was in as it is in Western countries. Now, if you go to any Western country, you will not see stormwater drains carrying sewage. Why? Because they have a separate system to collect the uh, the underground sewage, what's called the underground drainage network, and that goes to the sewage treatment plant. And a separate system to collect the storm water, it goes into a storm water drain and eventually into some water body, whether a lake or whether a river or whether the ocean, whatever it is. And the main thing is you have separation of these two systems that I talked about earlier, right? And in fact, you have pipe supply is a third system, which is completely separate. And these three systems in the Western world don't mix up. You don't, you get your pipe supply. If you go to a city like San Francisco, the pipe supply comes from a very pristine valley, the HHG Valley up in the mountains. The wastewater then is goes to a treatment plant and then it gets into the ocean. And the storm water goes through a storm water drainage system and into the ocean. Three completely unrelated systems. What happens in India is that all of these systems coexist and they do mix up. And the reason is that India has grown and urbanized so fast that you have uh, uh, the three systems getting mixed up. As a result of which, your pipes, are, and so actually four systems, because groundwater is the fourth system. All these four systems are mixed up. Why? Because your pipe supply, if you remember in my first slide, it leaks and goes into groundwater. So that happens. Then, what, uh, because you don't have pipe supply in some areas, uh, people depend on bore wells. So your, your domestic supply is coming from groundwater. That's the second set of things that happen. Third, your sewerage is no, systems are not built as a way, reason, as a result of which your wastewater is going into your stormwater system. So you're getting a mixture of the stormwater system and the wastewater system. These two systems have gotten mixed up. Fourth thing that happens is in some places, your uh, wastewater system is directly feeding groundwater. That's what's happening in the peri-urban areas through your soap pits and so on. Then your lakes are getting both stormwater and sewage mixed up, and that is going to groundwater, right? And then your groundwater, if your groundwater levels are very high, then your groundwater will feed back into the, uh, the lake system. And so you will basically have a much, much more complicated environment. I'll just come to this in a second. A much, much more complicated environment where in a very, very simple three completely separate systems of the Western world, we have a much more complicated intersection, intersecting set of systems. Now, this is complicated because when your 
municipal authorities are determining pipe supply and and so on they are thinking in terms of municipal boundaries in terms of wards bwssb for example has zones even chennai metro water whichever water utility you talk about they'll have distribution zones so their planning is done based on political or census boundaries but water flows based on watershed boundaries so what do we mean by watershed boundaries just to explain this is a relief map you can see that it's got mountains and it's got valleys you know just high elevation and low elevation now all i want you to imagine is if it rains okay if it rains on over here where will the water go it is water always flows from a high elevation to low elevation it's the nature of water it flows by gravity it doesn't start walking up a hill right so if it rains over here the water is going to go this way but if it rains over here the water is going to go in the other direction right the water doesn't care that this ward is split across two boundaries and this these yellow lines are supposed to be my ward boundaries okay i just made them all look square but never mind that the point is that water doesn't care that that uh, that the watershed boundary is not coinciding with the political boundary so how do you determine your watershed boundary a watershed is simply saying that what is all the area which is con contributing runoff to a particular point so watershed is always defined with respect to a particular point and it's saying if it rains what is the collection basin for that particular for from which all the water flows to that point that is called the watershed okay so we define watersheds with respect to predefined points in this case i am assuming this is a watershed outlet so then this orange thing which is uh, all is the collection area for all the water that comes here if there is something outside here if it's raining it will fall in the other direction if it's raining here it will fall that way and so on so the long and short of it is the whole thing uh, becomes even more complicated because your political decision making your pipe supply your government agencies are often defined in terms of your ward boundaries or census boundaries or ward political boundaries but your water is flowing according to watershed boundaries and therefore everything becomes more exciting and more fun um and so long and short of it if you just want to do accounting and say where did the water come how much came where did it go it becomes complicated because you're mixing up all of these different um this thing um so that's what makes it difficult to account for all of the uh, the internal flows now i just wanted to just repeat this is just a conceptual diagram of what i showed earlier where it rains the rainwater uh, gets captured and is directly captured through rainwater harvesting for the city some of it goes into the dams like in krs and it's brought brought by pipe supply into the treatment plant and then delivered to the city some of that leaks and goes into the aquifer the aquifer in turns people abstract water through their wells so that becomes part of the city supply and some of it is via tankers and some of it is via uh, hand pumps then the city itself the red lines are supposed to be waste water that's polluted water they they send water sometimes they selling it directly to the lakes um, sometimes directly to the waste water treatment plant and sometimes if they are households without linkages to the uh, underground sewerage system then they are directly leaking waste water into the aquifer sometimes they are dumping uh, uh, what waste water that's going into the lakes and then the treatment plant is treating water but it may not be the reason i put it purple is because it's important to realize that even when we treat water it doesn't become as pristine and pure as rain water it still has some nutrients in it so next week's class we'll be talking about that too, as you know at length of this implication of nutrients and so on and what they do what's the implication of that but the point is that all of that and then they, it also goes downstream now the, the important thing to realize is therefore this entire system is difficult and therefore if i want to ask questions like what will happen to lakes if my city grows like this or what will happen to lakes if i add a treatment plant what will happen to lakes if my groundwater goes down all of these questions become interconnected with each other because i can't answer that question unless i know what's happening somewhere else um so in general and what i will do if you look at the class from last time which is available in the iuwm channel that is linked from the google classroom i did spend quite a lot of time discussing how to estimate each of these components and which ones are easy to estimate and how they are estimated today's class i'm not going to be doing that if you're really excited about that you can go back and look at it from last last course which will be linked in um, google uh, google classroom um 
now the point is as i said some things are easily be measurable and other components of how all these things connected are not and that's what makes the entire uh, situation very challenging now i'm going to talk a little bit about floods and droughts and uh, i mentioned earlier if you remember that when we build cities um uh, that causes increased in paved, paved area urbanization is invariably associated with an increased in paved, paved area which prevents infiltration going into the ground and it improves evapotranspiration. Uh, it reduces evapotranspiration because you have less trees. Now, what does that do? Not only does it on aggregate increase the amount of uh, storm water. So now I'm just going to explain this graph for a second. This is saying that you have a rainfall event starting at this time. Okay. And then this is after it rains, it's the time. So let's say it rained for a little bit. I'm saying what is happening to the amount of flow Okay, if you had to measure flow in meter cube per second, what is happening to the amount of flow over time? This flatter graph is what a natural watershed would do because the nature of watersheds is to soak up the water. That's the way nature works and gradually release it back into the stream. Okay, and so nature automatically is acting, having some kind of a sponge effect. It's basically taking the water and, and, and it's gradually releasing it back. What happens with uh, uh, urbanized watersheds is because you prevented and you paved the land over and prevented nature from absorbing that rainwater and then gradually releasing it back, you get two things happening. Immediately after it rains, the rain has nowhere to go, it has no place to soak up. Immediately it will rise and then it will fall also much faster. So what nature does is it creates much more what we call flash flood type of events. So the, the reason I'm saying that is I want to anybody to understand that when we are talking about the flooding aspects the timing of the flow matters very much it's not just the total quantity of runoff that changes in a year which also matters of course and cities and uh, uh, natural watersheds look very different in that respect but it's also the timing that in cities the water comes like this really fast into the into the river that's why we're not able to cope with it and that's why we start having flash floods yeah so not only are the averages and the totals increased but the peaks that means the thing that happens if you remember in kerala you had very very high floods or chennai floods very very large amounts of water for a very few days and then after that it disappeared and dried up uh, and and so that's the important thing to realize in terms of floods and when we talk about lakes lakes then can play a mitigating effect because they have this ability their water storage structures they have the ability to hold some of that water back and so they have the ability therefore to dampen some of those peaks so that that we will see in a little minute when i'm talking about the intersection between lakes and the stormwater system uh, the second thing is what happens under droughts now if you remember i said this is what are very complicated system looks like in the Indian context. Now, what happens in a drought year? In a drought year, what happens is, I'm just going to show you this again. In a drought year, what happens is it rains less. So you, it's possible you may get less water from the reservoir itself. It can happen. Um, it, uh, it ha it's, you should have less water here as well. Um, uh, less water going into the lakes, less water going into the pipe supply system. But what happens in most cities is people start pumping groundwater. And what happens is you have less pipeline leakage going into the aquifer, a lot more of pumping from tankers and from directly from households. And as a result of which you might see a groundwater level suddenly going down. Um, you may also see less or more water, depending on whether overall consumption goes up or down. You may see less water entering the lakes. You may see less water entering the wastewater treatment plants. So the entire water balance of the city changes during a drought but it may not all change uniformly because in some cases you see uh increases because people will compensate they have to get water from somewhere so you're going to see pumping and some of those things increasing other flows will decrease and so the net water balance will change of the city but also the the rel relative linkages will also change okay okay now i wanted to talk briefly and i just literally added these slides when nagesh was talking looking at the chat uh, room uh, comments, which is what happens in peri-urban areas. A couple of people asked, um, are, you know, what happens when the lakes are uh, peri-urban lakes where there isn't as big of a sewage uh, 
uh, issue. It's not the typical urbanization and sewage kind of questions. Now, this is just showing you a depiction. I'm just showing you Bangalore because it's easy for me to do. This this is Bangalore, and this whole thing is the Arkavati watershed. There's an upper Arkavati and a lower Arkavati area. So if you know, this area is upstream of Bangalore. That means it's at a higher elevation than Bangalore. So Bangalore's water is not, wastewater is not flowing there. Rather, the water from here is flowing like this and going into this TGLE reservoir. So this is relatively an agricultural catchment. Um, here, this one is uh, Rishabhavati watershed. It is downstream of Bangalore. All of the wastewater from Bangalore is draining into the watershed. Now, if you compare the situation, just this is that's why I just wanted to show you the visual, the pictures of the uh, uh, graphs from uh, uh, of the tanks from upstream and downstream. Upstream, you see the problem is not that the there's wastewater coming in there's no pollution none of that but you actually have the problem of the lakes drying up and downstream you have the problem where all of the industrial effluent from and this particularly this area from which it drains has a lot of industrial area so you have a lot of industrial area effluent combined with all that raw sewage coming in so the story of the tanks downstream are heavily polluted tanks with industrial contamination also the story of the tanks and lakes upstream is a story of drying so the reason i'm saying that is it's important to realize since there were so many questions about what happens in in uh, uh, places outside the city lakes outside the city it really depends on what is the nature of the catchment in very agricultural catchments what we are seeing throughout india is because if, if there is heavy over exploitation of groundwater what happens is the water level in the catchment drops so much that the it actually starts sucking up all of the um, uh, the water from the uh, the surface um, I, i'm oversimplifying here uh, because I can't get into the technical aspects in the context of this course. But the long and short of it is that you see drying streams in overexploited rural catchments. And you see highly polluted and but increasingly wet and over full stream, you know, over full lakes downstream of cities. Um, so this is just our, I just wanted to show you some of our, uh, uh, what the, uh, the factors may be in rural catchments where it may be that because of climate change, you can see that, uh, there is some increasing and decreasing temperatures, but what we found in the Bangalore context, it is not true of every part of India in the Bangalore context, we could not find evidence of this, but we found that there was a lot of decline in stream flow because of increased evapotranspiration and deep groundwater pumping. That means if there's a lot of agricultural pumping, the water table, which used to be here, the blue one, and when the water table was so low, the groundwater used to feed the stream. Because, you know, surface and groundwater are just the same thing. They're not, they're not two separate resources. They are interconnected resources. But if the water table suddenly goes down, now you're going to have the, the ground the water moving from the stream into the aquifer, and therefore you have a drying of tanks happening. The second part of it is now how do lakes intersect with the entire system? I already explained some of this of what roles do lakes. Sorry, there's a question saying what is aquifer? Aquifer is groundwater, is the is the material or the rock material uh, which holds groundwater right so it's the it can be sandy type of material if you're in punjab and the gangetic plain and if you're in karnataka then it's more rocks and the rocks itself have holes you know little spaces in them what we call fractures the fractures hold water and you're getting the groundwater from that so the water bearing uh layers below the ground in the subsurface are called aquifers okay um I'm not paying attention to the chat box, but I'll give everybody a chance in a minute. I can see many people are asking, will the slides be made available? I'm happy to put it as a PDF and make it available, but I, there's a lot of other material as well as the last time's YouTube course all available. So I think that uh, that, that should help. I know that this is a lot to absorb. Um, I'm also going to be sharing other materials and courses that you can, can link to. Okay. So typically now uh what's the kind of this is the typical kind of lake systems that we see particularly in south india and there are two types i've deliberately drew them separately because i've seen both types this is more the situation that you see in bangalore you have the stream channels they've built buns of the stream channels the, the lake fills up when it fills up it overflows and goes downstream 
In cities like Coimbatore along the Noyal, you'll see a slightly different type of situation, which is what is called an off-system tank. Here, what happens is the tank is not, the bund has not been built directly on the stream channel, but rather they've built a little dam on the stream channel and the dam diverts some of the water into, uh, into the lake. And then when the lake fills up, it, it overflows and comes back downstream into the river. So this is a case where, um, uh, where you'll see that there are off-system uh, tanks and the water flows. Uh, it's not directly a, a, a tank which is built on the stream channel, but it is fed via a dam uh, which is built on the stream channel. Uh, this is the more kind of situation you see in cities like Bangalore. I saw somebody posting that they similar situation in Vidarbha as well. Many, many parts of semi-arid India, you will see these, these same kind of systems, uh, which are these cascading tank systems. Now, of course, what happens is that as the city grows, uh, a lot of, as I said before, a lot of wastewater is being generated. Uh, the red is supposed to be the sewage and the wastewater is going into um, uh, into the tanks. And so not surprisingly, the lakes or tanks either way are getting filled up with uh, raw sewage and that's going to cause all kinds of pollution problems. Of course, you also have many places in Bangalore where you have an underground drainage system. So in Bangalore, we are a big city. Many parts of our city are indeed sewered. So the water goes into the sewage system, into a sewage treatment plant, but the sewage treatment plant is then feeding water into the lake. Sometimes it is working properly. Sometimes it's only partially functioning. Sometimes it's treated, but not all the nutrients have been removed. Like it doesn't, like I said before, become the quality of rainwater. It still has all kinds of salts in it. And so, uh, you may have pollution problems resulting from a whole range from fully untreated sewage or raw sewage to partially treated sewage to sewage which is treated but not all the nutrients have been removed and all of these are part of your system and for individual lakes in any city different conditions are going to hold and therefore different uh, solutions are also needed so long and short of it we started here many centuries ago we had pristine lakes which were rain fed meant for cattle and, and domestic and irrigation and then we ended up here because of the reasons i talked about which is i i put examples from bangalore but you see the same story every place in india um so overall what are the problems then with lakes first you have the problem of pollution uh, i put some statistics for bangalore here the number is changing every day so don't uh, uh jump on me if you belong you know if you work for bwssb for example i know new sewage treatment plants are constantly being built but um we still have a lot large amount of untreated sewage going into the uh, streams um even as i said before even if you have sewage treatment plants and the sewage treatment plants are feeding treated water into the lake you can still have very high nutrients and the nutrients can result in uh, algal blooms and this kind of thick, what we call cyanobacterial blooms. This will be addressed at, at length in next class, all of the mechanisms for these water quality problems. But just to say that just because you have treatment plants, all your problems are not going to get solved immediately. Um, and again, we will be dealing with this issue of nutrient cycles uh, and why high nutrients lead to those kinds of problems in the next class. And finally, of course, we have the problem of drying. Now, I want one think you know to say that drying can happen in bangalore lake in in lake in cities like bangalore sometimes with very good intentions so what happens is that when you have a drain which was feeding a lake and the drain is very polluted what the solution that a lot of municipalities do is they put a um, a, a sort of a barrier between the drain and the lake because they don't want the polluted water to enter the lake now what happens is that what that the, what purpose is that diversion drain supposed to do so, so that the everyday polluted water that is in the drain will not enter the lake but if you have a big amount of rain the water will go up in that during that storm event and the storm and uh, sewage mixed water so the storm water will dilute the sewage and that much diluted sewage only that will go into the uh, lake so uh, some uh, so you'll see the the solution if we can't solve all the pollution problems in many lakes in india is to build these diversion drains now problem is sometimes the diversion drain that wall which is built between the drain and the lake is so high uh, sometimes i've seen them be even two meters high so nothing even when it rains very heavily nothing enters the lake and in cases like that essentially it is 
uh, the lake which is becoming dry even when it rains very heavily the water doesn't enter the lake the lake goes dry but it is actually drying by design that means it was something that was done in the engineering structure in the diversion drain to in order to prevent pollution but with along with preventing pollution you're preventing all water from entering the lake right so this is one example what i call throwing the, uh, the you know the, using the joke throwing the baby out with the bath water it's like throwing the rain water out with the bath water um, example and finally you have flooding why does flooding happen flooding happens for a variety of different reasons in one, many places and this is again an example from bangalore the tank has just been uh, uh taken over built for development whether legally or legally but in bangalore the stadiums and bus terminuses were built on tanks so suddenly you've reduced the amount of water holding capacity not only have you reduced the water holding capacity you've increased the runoff because of urbanization at the same time so you've increased the need to hold storm water you've increased your generation of flood water you've decreased your holding capacity for flood water. So both things simultaneously, not surprisingly, in low-lying areas, you're going to see flooding. There are a variety of other reasons that may happen. You may have encroachment of drains in some place. You may have blockage of drains in some place. Um, so variety of reasons why you may have that the uh, lake holding capacity, uh, you know, the outlet from the lake has gotten blocked. So the water is backing up uh, from the lake. So long and short of it, when it rains, when runoff is going to get generated, runoff is going to go into the stormwater channels, it's going to try and reach the lakes. That's what nature does. If you've created blockages and encroachments and so on, or if you've already kept the lake full because it's getting sewage water, either treated or unsewage treated water, throughout the year the lake is already full, there's no place for that stormwater to go. So then what is going to happen is it looks really good. You have a beautiful lake, it's full throughout the year, but it's not going to help with create for flood storage because when it rains there's no place for that extra rainwater to go all of these and these are if you understand they are very very different sets of reasons but all of these may contribute to flooding and, and so i hope at least this link between uh floods and um uh and and lakes and uh, has become clear now it's important to realize that um uh, lakes historically and nagish uh, sorry professor inayatullah mentioned it previously uh, in his comments that lakes were traditionally thought of as being storage structures uh, they were meant for irrigation in the dry season now today what has happened is that apartments have come up around lakes people we've lost all of our green spaces in the city and so people are now looking for lakes to have a whole bunch of other uh, functions which they were not originally conceived of nobody said let rural lakes may have a lot of um, diversity, but they were not created for the purpose of biodiversity, right? They were created for the purpose of storage. Today we have people where we have borders, we have uh, Nagesh mentioned now that the you know we've destroyed so many of the other water bodies and urbanized that lakes have de facto become the only places where migratory birds can stop because everything else has been dried up. So as a result of that. The demand or what is expected of lakes has changed over time. And now we expect the lakes to be spaces for recreation. We expect them to be biodiversity havens. We expect them to perhaps serve livelihood functions like fishers, fisheries and fodder. So mainly many other things. Now it's important to realize that all these different uses can sometimes be competing. So what you need for a lake to be a good flood control structure or to be a good water storage structure may or may not be what you need for a lake to be a good biodiversity zone. And in fact, you will see in the design of lakes for biodiversity that these things will come directly into conflict with each other. So for example, if you want uh, a birder might say that I need the lake to be full or have a lot of water throughout the year so that the migratory birds in summer have a place to drink. I'm making this up. It depends on the context of every given lake. But a flood control engineer, the municipal engineer would say, no, we want to keep the lake level slightly low in the summer so that we have space for the flood water to come in. Similarly, you may say that if you're going to use the lake for dry season irrigation or dry season anything, you may say that you want the lake to be full throughout the year so that you have it throughout the monsoon and then use it up in the dry season. While uh, if you're a fisherman, you may say, wait, you can't empty the lake what will happen to all the figurelings i've put in so you may want the lake to be full throughout the year or you may not want the level to drop below something um 
So these different demands of biodiversity, flooding, water security and fisheries can all be at conflict with each other. And there's no correct answer. This is notoriously true. Somebody mentioned with her, but you'll see these uh, even in rural tanks where the fishermen and the uh, farmers fight with each other about how much water should be left in the tank. So these are universal problems. Uh, therefore, unless you understand what is the purpose of the lake, coming up with how do I rejuvenate and manage the lake? For what purpose? How do I maintain the tensions between different stakeholders you can do it you can find compromises for everything but you have to at least understand that these issues exist right so um i'm going to talk first about uh, this conventional paradigm of water management um, and this i already talked about when i first showed it but basically to show that the way people have historically designed cities is to separate out water wastewater and some water on the other side the water wastewater side is to worry about getting people water for drinking and cooking and taking the wastewater away and preventing disease and the goal of storm, storm water management is don't let the city flood and ensure that environmental amenities and river aquatic ecosystems are maintained and none of them worry about groundwater even in foreign countries groundwater in cities is nobody's baby it's like a forgotten stepchild now in bangalore what we are really talking about is we're talking about bringing all three things together and this is called integrative uh, urban water management i have provided a couple of um, resources they will all get they are scheduled to post at 5 pm today on how Singapore does what is called the four tap system. The integrated water, urban water management paradigm generally consists of groundwater, stormwater, wastewater, and piped water. And how do we plan and think about all of these four components of the city in a holistic manner? How do we create plans? And how do we get the different agencies that look at these different things to talk to each other and then come up with a management that includes all of these instead of doing them piecemeal. Somebody is doing something on wastewater, somebody else is doing something on stormwater, they're not talking to each other. So this is the concept of integrated urban water management. Um, so as I said, in the conventional paradigm, these two are considered separate in the integrated urban water management paradigm. They are actually um, uh, linked. So this is the conventional where they're completely separate, right? The rainwater to lakes to uh, downstream is completely separated, the rainwater to pipe supply to wastewater downstream. Uh, in the integrated water management, they are much more uh, integrated. This is the reality in Indian cities. It's not going to change in a hurry in the next 10 years. And so we really need to be thinking about at least for the next 20 years, how do we view the system as an integrated system? Um, the next paradigm that you will read about is what is called low impact development. Now, low impact development is a term that is used to describe primarily the stormwater part of it. And this is generally done in places where there's a lot of flooding. That means you built a city and suddenly the city has started flooding like crazy because you urbanized and paved so much. And the city doesn't have the money or the ability to build larger and larger stormwater drains. So what, what is low impact development is they're trying to say that, can we, in, can we consciously figure out clever ways to conserve natural ground cover as much as possible and so that you're making the city look as much like the pre-development city if you remember the natural city nature of na natural land sorry is much more absorbent and slow release of water paved areas urban areas are uh, are non-absorbent and fast release of area and the idea with low impact development is can we be clever about how we de design cities so that we are making them a little more porous improving infiltration and storage uh, also reducing pollution in various ways and then keeping that runoff ratio, that thing, that graph that I showed you, so that the, the city then is behaving a little more like a natural catchment, but we are doing it in a clever way, right? And when people talk about low impact development, what are they doing? First, they're saying, what are the pre What did the city look like before they were, they, we put all of this concrete and buildings and paved land on it? Then we say, okay, what do we want it to look like? How much of flooding can we withstand in terms of being able to build new stormwater infrastructure to carry away the water and so on? And then what are the constraints? Obviously, I would like to maybe build, you know, big lakes in the middle of the city. And I can't do that once the city is fully built. I have to work with what is available. Um, and then finally come up with a nice bundle of practices that will, uh, will make the city reduce the flood peaks as much as possible. 
Now, the second term you will see is water sensitive urban design. Now, water sensitive urban design is a uh, is an approach that is primarily used in the landscape architecture community. And these are those large architecture and urban planning firms where they are designing, you know, waterfront uh, this thing. So you might have heard of the waterfront projects in Gujarat and elsewhere. Uh, and so they are saying, how do I make the city architecturally both look aesthetically good, but also be more water sensitive. So the entry point into water sensitive urban design is coming from the architecture urban planning community. And they are asking, how do I make my planning and designs of uh, whether it's a corporate campus, whether it's a building campus, how, how do I make it more sensitive to water? But in this case, there's a lot of emphasis on the aesthetics also, because it's coming from the architecture, landscape architecture community. There's a lot of emphasis on how do I also make it look beautiful? How do I increase real estate values? All of that. How do I minimize environmental degradation? How do I use plants cleverly so they look good, but they also serve these biodiversity functions? So this is what the water sensitive urban design paradigm is. Uh, the third term that you might see is what is called room for the river. This is I've not seen it used in India much, but it's primarily in meant for places where flooding and flooding from the river channel itself is a massive problem. So you might imagine this being relevant in places like Gujarat, uh, sorry, places like Jharkhand and Bihar, which where flooding of the river channels itself uh, is a massive problem. And here the idea is, look, when it rains, the river is going to flood. If you put these massive walls or embankments, which is the very traditional civil engineering way of looking at it, sometimes they breach and they cause much more damage. So can we, in our design itself, create room so that we create strategically telling the river, essentially, you can flood in these places, you can overflow your banks and, you know, in these places. So you're creating uh, your common spaces, your parks, your stadiums, whatever else, in places very strategically where it's okay if the river floods there. Nobody minds if your park uh, is flooded for five, six days. We don't want it to be in the middle of, uh, you know, factories or in the middle of a nuclear power plant or a very expensive real estate or even very poor real estate. None of those. You want to create it strategically in a place where you're by designing, creating places for the river to flood. So that's the idea of the room for the river. Mainly this it has been implemented in the Netherlands. You would think about it in India in the context of places where there's a lot of over um, a flooding over the, uh, the banks of a river. Now, Spun City is a concept that you see primarily, I've seen it in the, it's a Chinese uh, term um, where um, it's really about how do I prevent flooding on one hand, but it's slightly different from, uh, not different, at the end of it, the basket of options that you're doing in these are overlapping. They're not all identical, but they're very overlapping. They're all trying to make cities more porous and then make them more natural in their context. But the objective of the Spun Cities programs in China is to retain more flood water, but to do it in a way that it is available during a drought year. So it's basically saying, how can I make cities into sponges, but not just to release the water back, but so that we have it for use during drought periods. And so that involves a uh, a set of diff uh, slightly different things. It's very similar to the others, but there's also a focus on uh, on water quality, on how do we make the water available for use in dry periods and so on. Um, and so if you compare all of these and you look at the set of actions that are done in each, all of these, there's a lot of similarity. IUWM is, like I said, looking at all concepts, some water, um, uh, wastewater, rainwater, and piped water, all of them as an integrated way to look at water security in a city. Low impact development is focusing primarily on how do I prevent too much of flooding. And lakes could be uh, uh, part, part of the system if you wanted to think about low impact as saying lakes are places where you can store excess flood water when you have too much of it available. So lakes can be both thought of as part of room for the river or spun city or low impact development. Water sensitive urban design, as I said, is um, uh, can be include a lot of wastewater recycling, a lot of water features, a lot of low impact development features, but the, there's a lot of focus on aesthetics and uh, making it functionally uh, useful as well as serving various ecosystem functions. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is talk about the, the coming to the last section, which is on how do we make complex trade-off decisions. Now, what you will see 
throughout the lakes course and if any of you are working on lake systems anywhere in india you'll find that there's a lot of tension between what i would call differences in facts versus differences in values now this is a very important thing in our academic literature we call it the difference between the descriptive and the normative uh, descriptive means both people are looking at the same thing but i think that if you put low impact development it's not going to make any difference to the storm peak and you think if you put low impact development it is going to make a difference to the storm peak here the difference is in the facts themselves will it make a difference will it not make a difference is the groundwater 26 mm per year from a lake or is it 3 mm per year in a lake these are all differences in facts and the only way to settle them is by actually doing measurements doing science bringing technical people in uh, you know doing maybe some modeling and to figure out is it this or is it that but there is a set of differences on the right where people differ on what the value of a lake is and there is no easy way if one person says that a lake should look very beautiful you know everything should have lawns they should all be very neat uh, i want flowers and i don't like all these things which look little wild then that's a value and often the value there is between um, is in uh, it two people having just different values right you can have one person saying i like looking at wild spaces and other person saying i look like looking at very manicured gardens neither is wrong but it's a matter of then negotiating, saying how much of this can we have, how much of that can we have. We see these kinds of arguments all the time in lake groups. You know, should you allow fishermen or do the do they have a right, or is it that the fish are too stinky? Should you allow um, uh, children to bike on this thing, or is it important for old people to walk? I mean, some of these can be on very uh, on technical issues. Some of them can be on just uh, rights of who whose right is it. To have a walking way right children can might knock over the elders there are people who say that no we don't want elders is it right to have to give more priority to nature or more priority to old people whose needs are hurt so all of this stuff uh is differences between value statements i don't have any magic solution to any of the value things i mean who am i i'm, I'm just one person compared to anybody else so the only way to mediate across these values uh, is to have discussions around what is it that is allowed and not allowed. Now, uh, we may say that as a lake group, there are certain best practices and certain things which should not be violated, right? Even if the what if the community says, forget it, we don't want a lake at all. We don't mind a little bit of flooding. Uh, you know, we may want to say that that's going too far. We don't want to actually go all the way there. But um, but overall, the only way to actually decide what the purpose of a lake is, is to first work through all of these values decisions. Now, in that's one of the reasons that when we've designed this course, we specifically have a section on the framework for rejuvenation. And among that, we have the ecological considerations, the engineering and technical considerations. And then we also have uh, a visioning uh, process and how do we think about visioning and getting the stakeholder uh, stakeholders engaged so all of those are inherent parts of the rejuvenation process precisely for this because the technical aspects the scientists and engineers can't answer all the questions that some of it has to come from the community and the agencies involved um so for example this is just to give you an example so supp suppose we say we want water security for all what does that really mean we may be saying you know um that everybody should get a certain number of liters per capita per day people would disagree some people would say that should be 135 some people would say no i can't do without 200 other people say what why can't why are you guys so wasteful why can't you manage with 50 so there's a there's a value judgment there we have some definitions that the government uses but there may still be not everybody may agree with those then we say should people get it free or should they pay right um if they get it if they if it should be merely affordable what's the definition of affordable there are some good global standards generally two percent of income for for everybody what it should cost less than two percent of your income no matter how poor you are is uh is a global standard but do we agree do we not agree people may go both ways uh then you may say who is all you can say bangalore is there a boundary should there be if you keep on having migrants then the city keeps on growing and endlessly should you provide for this or you say the new areas take care of themselves these are all all arguments which nobody else can solve uh there's no easy answer for any of these yeah 
Um, and therefore, when we come up with a set of me measurements, and now I'm going back to uh, integrated urban water planning and, and management, then you may say supply augmentation, bring new, build a new reservoir in the Western Ghats, or increase the price, or reduce leakage, or put groundwater metering, or you have to mandate wastewater recycling. All of these involve both technical considerations and considerations about who will end up being the winner and loser in these cases. So it's it's not, you know, none of these are easy. And all I wanted to say was that you guys are willing to um, uh, struggle to this is something that we all uh, appreciate. So thanks for attending it. Thank you so much.